Very good morning to you and thanks for joining us on The Run-Up. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. It's been a very exciting week and now we're at the weekend and we're hoping that you're going to have a wonderful time. But we are edging closer and closer to the coming elections with less than 35 days to go. Nigeria's cyberspace today is replete with political bullies and trolls. Social networking platforms like Facebook and Twitter have become places where back-to-back -back insults and blackmailing of political opponents take place on a daily basis. We've seen uh, videos that are edited and really badly edited, voiceovers done in a very bad way and all that, just so that propaganda can go against a particular candidate or the other. The 2023 elections seem to come with the vibe the 2015 elections brought. The now ruling party APC meant business. It cyber bullied PDP out of government. The erstwhile president, good luck, Jonathan, bore the brunt of the mindless cyber bullying orchestrated by the opposition supporters. Fast forward to today. The same energy is spewing up, but this time not only on a single candidate like it was in the 2015 election, but on three major contenders for the office of the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, or four, if you may. Today, we'll be discussing the cyber political war, the revelation of influencers uh, being paid to manipulate voters, highlighting the positives and negatives of these and more. We'll just go on a quick break, and when we return, we'll be joined by our guests, and then we we'll start the discussion. Stay with us. Welcome back to you. It's still the run-up, and uh, we're here trying to look at a very specific issue today. Nigeria's cyberspace has been littered with avalanche of malicious utterances and statements now referred to as violence in the, in the Nigerian way, geared to ridicule, pass false information, and tarnish the image of and integrity of politicians vying for elective positions, especially the three most uh, um, medialized, if I may, presidential uh, candidates in the coming 2023 general elections. Uh, the momentum is spiraling to hive confusion and chaos on the increase on social media. Nigerians might just concentrate on favor frivolities, character assassination, intimidation of candidates and their followers, and don't focus on issues bedeviling the nation. And uh, like a pack of cards, the golden opportunity that we have been offered to change the trajectory of bad leadership might just be crumbled on the altar of frivolities and absurdities. We remember that uh, we, we've been talking about hate speech, we've been talking about fake news, we've been talking about a lot of other things, and this is the time to guard against all those things. With a recent documentary revealing Nigerian social media influencers are uh, being paid to drive false narratives about opposition parties and candidates, not also neglecting the cyber bullying of opposition supporters, there are about 84 million uh, over 84 million voters in Nigeria, with a large percentage still indecisive on whom to vote come 25th of February. And the manipulated narratives shared across social media platforms can or may influence their choices uh, in the coming election. Remember that the uh, Northern Elders Forum just said a few days ago, a few hours actually ago, that the Northern Elders have not decided on who to follow. They are still sitting on the fence and trying to get uh, insights from the people who are contesting. Well, we're jo being joined by uh, Mr. Stephen Kefers, uh, human rights defender, citizens journalist, and good governance advocate. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Uh, Kefers. Thank you for having me. We also have Ogbeni La, a social commentator. Good morning and welcome to the program, La. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Okay. It's interesting that both of you are in the UK, am I right? Um, I'd, first of all, I'd like to just know what level of excitement the diasporans are having uh, towards this 2023 election. What is the general feeling of those of you who are outside the shores of Nigeria as we approach 2023 election? Let me start with Ogbeni La. Um, I think uh, more than ever, uh, people in diaspora are very interested uh, in the forthcoming election. And I, I will say uh, this is due to the social media frenzy. Uh, I think uh, for the first time, people feel more part of the process. 
even though uh, people living in diaspora are not going to be voting, but they feel more part of the uh, process. So we are, we are excited and we feel part of it. Uh, I believe uh, Mr. Kefas we share the same uh, opinion. Okay. Uh, Kefas, not, not taking the exact words that I just um, used for uh, Benila right now, um, we have had three presidential hopefuls come to Chatham House, which eventually is in the UK where you are. Um, what are your takeaways from uh, what they presented at the Chatham House? What did it say about Nigeria and the image of Nigeria outside? And what, how does that make you feel as a Nigerian after listening to the three, some of the three, uh, three of the four major contenders uh, in the forthcoming elections? Thank you very much. Um, I think for the first time in a long time, we are approaching an election where um, we've seen some level of um, um, conversation um, from the candidates, the top candidates. Um, I think a few days ago, one of the candidates was in the UK, uh, Chatham House, as you rightly say. And um, we, we saw an intense conversation. We saw Nigerians living in the diaspora asking critical questions on how um, they intend to govern. You know, it's not about, um, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. No. It's about telling us how you are going to do it. And um, I really enjoyed the conversation. And um, other candidates were there too, even though not too impressive. But, but um, generally, at least, we've seen um, some level of seriousness where candidates are ready to talk to the people. I think that is what really matters. It means um, it's no longer business as usual where candidates, um, you know, put up some form of um, like a Jessica attitude and then just come get votes and um, they'll be in power. Because this time around, we are beginning to see a deliberate um, um, attempt by the candidate to engage the electorate. Like you said, um, um, like Ogweni rightly said, those of us in the diaspora uh, will not be voting because our laws, our electoral laws, um, do not permit that. But then um, it has created this level of awareness. And whether we like it or not, even though we will not be voting, we can also influence families and friends back home who also have um, roles to play in the election. Mm. Okay, uh, when he touched on that, he said the frenzy came because of the, um, the awareness created on the social media and all that. So let me, let me go back to Ogbeni right now. Uh, Ogbeni, um, in a nutshell, what would you describe the place of, how would you describe rather, the place of social media on the 2023 Nigerian general election? Um, thank you very much. Uh, Social media uh, and uh, how it affects the election. Um, social media has been like uh, the new media, and um, we've seen how important it is. Even aside politics, uh, in now uh, talents in Nigeria, the youth demography in Nigeria has been using it to better their life. And coming to the forthcoming election, uh, there are several ways we can use the social media to also influence uh, people's decision. Uh, the social media is just this borderless uh, platform. And that's why people in diaspora, uh, they can partake in how they influence people back home using social media platforms. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I think before the program started, when we were chatting uh, about uh, how influencers are being paid. Uh, what are these influencers? People using social media, the, the new celebrities that social media has uh, produced. And we see how strong their opinions uh, is on their followers. Uh, so, that shows how important social media is to the forthcoming election, as we've been saying. 
I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, already. yeah, yes, because I'm also going to Stephen uh, to also add something to that. How, how strong do you think the social media is going to influence the forthcoming election, whether for good or for bad? Yeah, um, absolutely. The social media um, is the main thing, you know, as, as far as um, this conversation is concerned. In 2015, um, from 2014 rather, we saw how powerful the social media um, can be. We saw how the social media was used against a sitting president uh, who was bullied, who was harassed, insulted, um, misinformation was spread about him, and eventually he lost the election. Now, and we have to understand that this thing called social media is a very powerful tool, right? And um, sadly, um, it's being used um, in the wrong way these days, where people are paid um, to, to use it to malign other people, which is not really good. But then, we cannot dispute the fact that whether we like it or not, the social media is going to play a very powerful role. Because even these days, some, some radio um, and TV stations get their news sources from the social media. You know, when I read um, the BBC documentary, I was like, wow, because they captured everything. Like, you go to the street, you go to the market, you see people discussing what was said on Facebook, even though they themselves are not on Facebook, but they are discussing what was said on Facebook about a candidate. So that's how powerful the social media um, has come to be, and um, it's going to play a key role on deciding the crop of leaders we are going to be having in um, the next election. Okay, well, social media, powerful tool, but it was written off by some of the candidates even who are using the social media now that it's, it's not, it's just something that will not hold water. For instance, there are some uh, people who were advocating for a change in uh, the kind of leadership that we have, and then uh, they said they were only social media warriors. Do you think whoever is talking on social media or what, however powerful the social media is, it will translate into votes on, in the physical? Will it ever be that way? Do you think Nigerians are strong enough, strong-willed enough, ripe enough to know that if they're talking on social media, they should also translate whatever they're saying into physical votes that will come? Absolutely. What gave you that confidence? Okay, um, let me explain. Um, in my Facebook page, I have about, about 20,000 followers. And uh, in the last 10 years, um, um, I've, I've, I've grown to be this influential that um, when whatever I write is being taken very serious by my followers, especially those from Kaduna, right? Now, it's that that gives me an understanding that hey look i cannot just mess up i cannot just write anything because these guys take whatever i write to the streets and they run with it now talking about the election let's go back to 2015 we all know what happened most of the misinformation against the sitting president then started from the social media and it spread like wildfire down to the street, down to the market, down to the remotest of uh, communities in Nigeria. So, and this thing has a way of persuading people and influencing their decisions. Imagine if I write on my Twitter handle that a candidate A was seen killing somebody yesterday. And because I'm an influencer, and people believe I've never written stuff that were not correct before, what do you think will happen? They will run with it before you know it's everywhere. And people don't even take time to, 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 to check whether what I've said is true. As far as they are concerned, Stephen Kefal is an influencer, and he said this candidate was seen killing somebody. I, I mean, it becomes facts. So that is how powerful this thing is. And um, like I said earlier, whether we like it or not, whatever happened in the social media, plays a very important role in what happened at the pulling units, at the world level, and the local government level. Okay, Ogbeni, let me come back to you. Um, from what uh, Stephen has said, 
you know, influencers have a very, very critical role to play. Unfortunately, that some of these uh, narratives may not even be true. So, in looking at that, do you think that the social media will make or mar the forthcoming election? Will it be that, since, like in Nigeria, people are divided along sometimes party lines, sometimes ideological lines, sometimes uh, financial lines, as it, it, is, it is, because some people, like we have said, are being paid. Whether they like the ideology of the person paying them or not, but they like the money that is coming from that person. Uh, can we now say that the 2023 election may not have the kind of credibility it could have had without the social media? Or do you think the advantages of having the social media are more? Let us know your thoughts. Um, first, before I answer your question, I, I'd like to backtrack to uh, your earlier assertion uh, about a presidential candidate that said uh, the social media will not make an impact on, mm, yeah. on uh, election day. I think that is very mischievous. Uh, every time we've been mentioning social media on the program, I think uh, we forget that WhatsApp also is social media. And I doubt if there is any serious uh, political candidate or party that do not have uh, groups on WhatsApp and all that. Now, don't forget that whatever people uh, like Kefa, uh, who has a major following on, on Facebook or Twitter, whatever they post, this thing comes back as BCs on WhatsApp, and you know how far it goes. Even people that are barely literate, they have WhatsApp, and it's what they see they run with. So I think uh, the social media is going to play a pivotal role on the forthcoming election. And coming to your question, uh, I think it would be backward for us as a people to be thinking along the line that if the, would the election have been more credible without social media? Uh, social media is a uh, it's part of human development. We need to run with it. I think uh, it is our responsibility and duty to make the best of it. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a developmental uh, innovation and invention. So it behoves on us as a people to use it positively uh, to our benefit and development. And uh, you mentioned uh, people being paid. Yeah, it has always, I've always had uh, this discussion within myself uh, are people, because uh, being an influencer is a job. I would know about that. I also have uh, as much as 20,000 followers on Facebook, even though I try not to call myself an influencer. But I know it is a job. So uh, do you say a lawyer should uh, not collect money to represent a client. So it becomes like a moral issue and not a legal one because, like I said earlier, being an influencer is a job. So what I think is uh, we should be advocating for people to love their country more than themselves. And uh, hopefully, we'll have people with conscience. Personally, myself, uh, even with my followers, I've uh, refused to influence for any candidate uh, in the forthcoming election. And despite having my own personal candidate, but because of this, uh, this moral issue of uh, can you justify within yourself this money you've collected to do this job, this influencing job, mm. you know? And uh, this is also a fallout of this cyber bullying we've been seeing because some people that uh, maybe let me use Mr. Kefers as an example. Mm. If you have followers that over the time they've believed in you and at the end of the day, as a person yourself, you have this political choice to choose who you want to support. 
Now, you might be doing it out of your conscience, like this is who I believe in. And by the virtue of your position as an influencer, you might also get paid for that your belief. Now, you have followers that do not necessarily share the same belief with you. Maybe your choice is an unpopular one on social media. And this, they come at you for your choice. People that have been, you know, your followers, they come at you at, and we start hearing uh, phrases like cancel culture. So uh, these are things I think we should uh, discuss. And this brings me back to saying we must love our country more than ourselves. This is the solution I see. So that when you love your country more than yourself, one, you respect people's choice uh, because this is the beauty and challenge of democracy. Majority of the people are not always right. That's a challenge. But then that's how democracy runs. People should be free to support whoever they like. But we should just keep advocating that they love their country more than themselves so that hopefully people would not uh, support candidates or influence for candidates based on parochial interest or for the love of the country. Uh, okay, um, <laughs> Stephen, now the, the dilemma we're finding ourselves in is that um, on the one hand, like Ogbeni said, there is a business to be done and money to be made. Food should be on the table because of what you know how to do. And on the other hand, there is morality. Uh, you're, you're thinking about what is right. And patriotism, uh, you're thinking about your country, what is good for the country. Just this morning, I got a call and someone was saying that uh, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to vote for a particular candidate, but I am campaigning for another candidate. And I asked why. And he said, because the other candidate has money and we have to partake of that money. And then on the day of election, we vote for someone else. So I don't know. How, how can we make this social media work for us? Because even though everybody has freedom of expression, but there's a way that it can cause havoc as well for us as a people. Maybe just because we want something, uh, we want to get it immediately, we leave patriotism, we leave morality, we leave everything that makes us a people uh, of, of integrity. So how can we make this social media work to our advantage as a people rather than dividing us? Because a lot of things that happen on the social media, if not checked properly, could divide us as a country, could divide us as a people. So how do we make it work in our advantage? Thank you very much. Um, Obeni has said um, so much on how this thing works, but then there's an angle I want us to look at. I personally, um, I've tried to be very careful when it comes to um, um, talking about candidates on my social media platform. Even though this um, year um, I had to break my own rules, like sometimes I want to talk about certain candidates because of the qualities I believe they have. Now, um, the problem here is, yes, influencing is a business. They are businessmen, just like the lawyers, the doctors, and other professions. Of course, they could be paid um, to, to influence um, or sell certain candidates. But the issue here is this. Now, when, when you are paid to sell a candidate, there is something, there's, 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 there's a repercussion. And what is the repercussion? You automatically lose the moral ground to want to hold the candidate accountable in the future. Now, because even when the candidate ends up not doing what he promised to do, you cannot call him or her out because you were paid to support him. Many a times on my social media platform, I challenge politicians. I said, if you know you've ever given Stephen a dime to, to, to sell you or to campaign or to, to influence people to vote for you, please speak up. And nobody, no politician in Nigeria or in Kaduna has ever come out to say, yeah, Stephen, I paid you money. 
there have been offers. They've reached out to me. Stephen, you have the followership. In Kaduna, people, people believe whatever you say. Guy, come, let's, let's, let's come, let's have a deal. I said, no. If you are good, I will support you without collecting money from you. So I think if, if we begin to have this mindset, how much are they going to give me? Maybe one million, maybe two million, maybe three million, maybe five million. I mean, that money is not enough to, to, to take care of me in four years. So patriotism is key, like Ogbeni rightly said. Once we are patriotic, once we have love for our countries, we'll begin to see beyond just the money that we are going to get from this politician. And not just getting money to influence who people vote, but then getting money to misinform the people. I think that's, that's um, the bone of contention here. You get money to tell lies. Um, I, I've seen a lot of lies on cyberspace. And thank God for some fact-checking um, outfits who are coming to fact-check some of these things and pointing out the lies, pointing out the facts. I think they're also doing a good job. But there's something that is shocking. When these fact-checkers do their fact-checking and maybe tweet it, they hardly get the retweets. Because nobody wants to know that this thing has been fact-checked. And that is the problem. And that goes to show that it is not about patriotism. It is about the Benjamin, the money. What am I going to be paid? And like you rightly said, um, this can throw the country into chaos. We saw it in the post-election crisis of 2011. I was in northern Nigeria. We saw what happened. Coppers were killed. A lot of people were killed. In fact, your name alone tells the other person who you voted for in 2011. And people were killed based on their tribe, their religion, because they believe that if you are from the South, you voted for good luck, Jonathan. I saw a lot of people being killed in Kaduna during that post-election crisis. Now, we won't want a repeat of that. But sadly, like Ogbeni rightly said, the social media is a borderless platform. There's no border. There's no wall. There's no gate. So it's very difficult to control. But then, one way out is orientation. We need to keep orienting the people at the grassroots level so that they will also have a mechanism to see what they hear from their influencers. I mean, they don't just swallow everything hook, line, and sinker. When the influencer says something, they should have the ability or a mechanism to see it, to check, ah, this thing, is it true? Instead of just running with it, and before you know it, um, it begins to spread like wildfire. So I think if we can do that, um, media houses like yours um, can do a lot of jingles, a lot of orientation, a lot of messages, you know, in different languages, Alsa, Yorubas, Igbos, like telling the people that, hey, look, it's not everything that comes from this social media is fact. Sometimes you've got to check it. You've got to see Just it. Just a moment, to, Stephen. Yeah, uh, thank you. It's not li like I'm trying to cut you. Just hold your thoughts for a moment. We just need to take a short break. And when we return, we'll continue with uh, uh, what you are, you are saying uh, right now. Uh, both of you gentlemen, just, just stay on. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, this patriotism more in depth and the things that we should look out for. Because when we talk about social media, we also talk about the traditional media as well, because these are all avenues where we talk to our people. So what should people be looking out for? So that even if there's someone out there looking out for 1,000, 2,000, or 100,000, as the case may be, just to make money off this election season, we should also try to talk to the people of deeper uh, needs that our nation should, get, should have so that our nation beyond 2023 will be a better country for everybody to live in. Maybe by that time, both of you will not be in a diaspora because everything you need in the UK will be in Nigeria. So just stay on. Uh, after the break, we'll continue with what we've been discussing. You're welcome back. It's still uh, the run-up, and my name is Nyamgul Agaji. I've been talking with Stephen Kefas, an exiled human rights defender, citizen journalist, and good governance advocate. And also, I have Ogbeni La, a social commentator. We're talking about the uh, cyber war, will I call it that, uh, because social media war, 
uh, so to speak, uh, where some, some candidates are doing some things <laughs> to others. Okay, followers of some candidates are doing some things, propaganda here and there, fake news here and there, sometimes some information, information that you, you see as outright bizarre, but they are going on. I've seen videos where people are being warned not to go out and vote because of one thing or the other, and then you find out it's just a voiceover. You find out the pictures do not even match with the voice and all that. But it seems some people somewhere are desperate about some things. I don't know who is behind what, but what we're concerned about is that we want the credibility of the 2023 election to be top-notch. We want a... a 2023 to be a defining factor or defining year for Nigeria, and everybody is, is praying for that. But if uh, this continues on the social media, uh, this kind of a war, sometimes telling people wrong stories and all that, it may not do or uh, go well for us as a country. But as we're talking about this war, we also need to know uh, or to tell the people what the people need to know, what Nigeria stands to gain or lose if the right things are not done, because some people may not know and they'll just follow the current. So we're still talking with Stephen and uh, Ogbeni right here. Uh, let me start with Ogbeni, because Stephen was the last one who was talking before we went on the break. Uh, Ogbeni, now, patriotism is something that is as important as blood is for the human being, because you want to take care of yourself. You don't want to lose blood and die. You want to take care of yourself. And if a country has to survive as a country, we need to love that country like we love our bodies and the blood that is in, us, in our veins. But patriotism may not be in our society as much as it should be. If you had the chance of Beni, what would you do to imbibe the culture of patriotism in the average Nigerian child? Um, thank you very much. If I have the chance, uh, I would um, erect structures for reorientation in Nigeria. Mm. I think we used to have something during the uh, Obasanjo presidency. Uh, the National Orientation Agency was very uh, mm. active then. I remember some jingles that used to run uh, on our on our media traditional media then asking people to love the country uh, and all that i think it was uh, although the the effect was slow uh, but i think it was effective it was uh, if the momentum has been kept i think we would have had more uh, political literacy uh, in the country uh, leading to this particular election, I think our people need the reorientation, what it means for a country to work and how it benefits more people. We are, we are very selfish and uh, people, once people are, they are fine, they don't think of the other. But if you look at countries that work, uh, it's more protective. We, we need a country where no matter who you are in the society, you have access to uh, basic uh, stuff like education, health, and all that. So, and that can only be achievable if, if you do collective interest. So if I have a chance, I think it would be uh, that reorientation. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I would do. I want, I want to stay on your particular question yeah <laughs> oh, if you have branches let's know them now because <laughs> because <laughs> we're really concerned about this issue our our yeah. people the models the people that our society models children nowadays after the template has changed from what it used to uh, be in the past and now so if you talk yeah, about it's a changing world. It's a, it's a very, changing world. Yeah. yeah, it's a changing world, and we have to evolve with it. Uh, aside this commitment, I think what we also lack is accountability. Mm. Uh, Mr. Kefas mentioned the, the other time, even when we have uh, misinformation on social media uh, by people that have been paid, and we have fact checkers, you know. 
pointing it out. So what becomes of it afterward? I think uh, the bodies that are supposed to implement, because I know we have uh, cyber laws, uh, but are they being, when people run foul of it, what happens next? Uh, the executive organ of uh, the government that are saddled with the responsibility of uh, implementing these laws, are they doing so? Because if someone should run with misinformation, let's say they are being paid, and like I said earlier, I believe, is my personal opinion, that they have a right to be paid to do the job they do. But what they do not have the right to do is to pass misinformation. That is illegal. That is no longer a moral issue. So when we have other people fact-checking these things and bringing it out, so what happens afterwards? So I would say, aside the reorientation of the people about our civic responsibilities and duties, I would also say the executive organ of uh, the government in Nigeria should be alive to their duties. Mm. Uh, they should hold people accountable. If you run foul of laws, this is no longer moral issues. Uh, this is legal or illegal matter. You should be held accountable. That is also what I would do yeah. if I was in position. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me come to you, Steve. What would you do? Because uh, people like you with, with thousands upon thousands of followers, um, you surely, as you have said, uh, say some things, uh, choose your words. Let me put it that way. You choose your words when you're writing anything on your wall because the people take it, some of them hook, line, line and sinker. So what would you say uh, can help Nigeria to develop, to cultivate this uh, patriotism that will help us do the right thing, even in the face of uh, fake news, in the face of propaganda, in the face of a lot of things because of some selfish interest? Thank you very much. Um, you see, patriotism is a two-way thing. Um, for, for, for someone to want to be patriotic to his country, his country must also be ready to be patriotic to him. Right. Um, we've seen a lot of um, unaccountability when um, those saddled with um, the mandate to do certain things, like the minimum requirement for the people are not doing it, like protection of lives and properties. And um, of course, an average Nigerian just feel I don't owe the country anything because the country doesn't do nothing for me. The country doesn't secure me. The country doesn't protect me. So that is the mindset. But then the National Orientation Agency, before I left Nigeria, I was with um, the former DG. I used to work with the former DG, National Orientation Agency. Um, Dr. Mike O'Meary, who was the DG during President Goodluck Jonathan. I think he left office in 2015 when the current um, APC government came to power. And then um, while he was DG, that agency was up and running. So I interviewed him because the National Orientation Agency is a very powerful agency of government. Yeah, I agree. But, but, but because in Nigeria, I, you know, I was, I was worried. And even he himself... He's worried that that agency has been neglected for far too long. The funding to the agency is poor. The people saddled with the responsibility to manage the agency seem not to understand the importance of that agency um, to the country. Now, this is an election year. Have you heard the National Orientation Agency um, doing anything? They are not doing much. Why? It is deliberate because during that interview, I found out that um, the political elites, some of them in government, they know that if that agency is up and running effectively, it will be able to correct some of the ills we have in society today. And they know that if these ills are corrected, they stand the chance of losing their political relevance. Hmm. It's, it's just like when you go to northern Nigeria, for instance. You see the illiteracy level is very high. You see a lot of out-of-school children. It is deliberate. Because when you empower these people by educating them, I mean, 
they become useful to themselves and society. They will now know um, what is good and bad. They will now be able to decipher a good politician and a bad politician. So, there's a deliberate attempt by the political elite in Nigeria to, 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 to weaponize poverty. They so weaponize poverty that um, once it's election year like this, they come, they bamboozle people, and they get their vote. So patriotism cannot be patriotism if the other party is not keeping um, its own um, side of the bargain. So yes, I want to be patriotic to my country, but my country should protect me. So, we need to begin to advocate that the National Orientation Agency must be allowed to run effectively. Every country has such an agency, and they play a key role. In fact, that is the image maker of the country. That is the agency that um, 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 preach morality, preach patriotism, and try to tell the people what to do and what not to do. But ours is dying. In fact, ours is dead already. You know, so that agency, I, I, I'm very glad Obeni brought that up. And because I've interviewed the former DG of that agency, that agency needs to be revived. Competent people need to be appointed to head the agency so that uh, we can begin to see a new image for Nigeria. Because if the National Orientation Agency is doing its duty as it ought to do, I'm telling you the issue of um, influencers being paid money to misinform the public will not even be a problem because you have an agency of government that has access to major television and radio stations in all languages in Nigeria. I mean, that is a powerful tool, even more than the social media because uh, um, uh, they can do jingles in Hausa language and you have all the radio stations, including international radio stations, airing these jingles. I mean, it will go in a long way. And during Obasanjo, we saw in marketplaces, on Billboard, we saw messages you know, that tend to preach patriotism. And I mean, as a child then, there's this particular one, um, uh, change begins with me, yeah. you know, and some of these jingles, even in primary school, sometimes we're meant to um, recite these things with excitement, but today it's not there. So I, I, I don't know how we're going to go about it, but then thank God this is a media platform. Yes. Um, if, if we can preach this message, that agents, in fact, the interview I had with Dr. Mary was in May um, last year, just two months before I left the country. And he told me something. He said, this is election. The National Orientation Agency ought to be up and running, informing Nigeria, like telling them things they need to know about the election. And also, INEC, too, has a role to play because INEC also has a department for uh, voter education. But have you really seen them doing any education? No. So there's a system, there's a corrupt system, there's a terrible system in place meant to make sure that the status quo remains. Because if the status quo change, certain people will lose political relevance. Okay, gentlemen, we'll really have to wrap up, but uh, n uh, not until we, we get your thoughts, a uh, few thoughts. You remember that we started with uh, the cyber war, the social media war, as it were, and we talked about this war as just amplifying frivolities, things that are not important at all. So we moved from there to the crux of the matter, the things that are really important that Nigerians should, should begin to know. But coming personally to you now, apart from the snow that you find in the UK, in America, and the, and the rest of uh, those parts of the, the globe, every other thing can also be had in Nigeria. And I'm sure that if some particular things are put in place, the two of you are, who are in diaspora could have still been in Nigeria. So let me start with Ogbeni. What are some of the policies that you would like the next government to put in place so that people like you may not even need to travel to the UK to make ends meet? And everybody will have their individual ones. But as briefly as possible, Ogbeni, tell us some of the things that you expect after uh, the forthcoming election and when the new government comes in? Let me quickly say I relocated because I married somebody uh, staying in the UK and uh, I'm always coming to Nigeria every time. I have a lot of uh, interest. Uh, I believe so much in the country 
Mm. Uh, there are no special policy. I, I, I would like to correct this uh, misimpression that Nigeria is done and all that. The potentials the country has, uh, many countries that are functioning well do not have it. Even as it is at the moment, we just need good leadership. And most importantly, we need accountability. Mm. Nigeria does not necessarily need new laws, new policies. With what we have at the moment, we should make the best use of them. We have not maximized them. The laws we have already, to what percentage are they being uh, enforced at the moment? Mm. The policies that are already there, to what uh, percentage are they being implemented? So, I, and I think it all boils down to this patriotism. We should have the love of the country at heart, and we should give it our best choice. Whoever imagines we are, we are one, we should just give it our best shot. That's what I would say. Uh, okay, let me come to you, Stephen. You are on exile. You're a human rights defender, a citizen's journalist, a good governance advocate. Definitely, you would have still been in Nigeria. Some circumstances may have led you to leave the country, but if they were not there or some things were put in place, you could have still been in Nigeria. What are you expecting from the next administration so that you or people like you will not need to run away from the country? Uh, you will be here to contribute your quota. Security, security of lives and property. Um, you know, I, I tell people that um, that is the primary responsibility of any government, anywhere in the world. Once you can guarantee the safety of your citizen, I'm telling you, they can do anything on their own. Okay. What, what, what most Nigerians are asking for is that let them be safe in their country. Let their properties be safe. Let their businesses be safe. Mm. Nigerians are hardworking. If, if there was security, I bet you many of us would be back home. Me, me, me personally, um, you know, I've escaped countless threats and attempts. So it got to a point, friends had to like, guy, you have to leave this country. I kept dragging my feet because I love Nigeria. In fact, there was a day I woke up, I told my guy, I said, guy, I want to go back to Nigeria. The guy said, are you sick? I said, because that's where my heart is, you know. But then, there they, they, they needs to be security in Nigeria. Yeah. If that is the only thing the next government will achieve, I'm telling you, most of us would want to return back to the country because there are lots of potential, there are lots of opportunities there. Okay. To explore. Even, even better than what we have in some of these countries. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we've been talking with uh, Stephen Keffers, uh, the human rights defender and citizen's journalist, a good governance advocate. He likes all those titles to him, it's his name, and we like it for him <laughs> as well. And also, we're talking with Ogbeni La, a social commentator. Eventually, both of them are in the UK, but they still love Nigeria. And would like to thank you, gentlemen, for coming on the show this morning. Okay, uh, we'll take a short break now in order for us to bring you the news. And when we return, we'll wrap up the show. Stay with us. <laughs>